Well, good morning. It's 8.30, everybody, so I'm not going to take much time at all. Uh, I would like to go around and have everybody introduce themselves and just um, share, you know, what your role is. So, and we won't take much time, but it, I don't know if your screens are the same, but I have um, Tamerlan at the top and then John and Kelly. So if Tamerlan, if you can, if, I think that's first name, if you can just start with an intro and what you do. Um, that, um, that uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, good. Um, I am a uh, master's student at the University of Northern Iowa, uh, involved in the local food movement. And I'm just here to glean some information from you. Great. Thank you. John. All right, hello. Uh, my name is John. I work with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach in Jasper County as the Local Foods and Horticulture Program Coordinator. Um, unfortunately, I will have to leave a little bit early today because I've got to go make a client visit about their lawn. So mm. I'll glean what I can from you all. And then there will be a recording, so. Perfect. Okay, Kelly with a Y. Hi, this is Kelly Hansen with Iowa AUIC. Um, farm to Early Care and Education Program Specialist. Cool. Thanks, Kelly. Kelly Solberg. You'll have to take it. There you go. Hi, Kelly Solberg from Woodbury County Extension. Um, I'm the Regional Foods Coordinator for uh, Northwest Iowa and then also uh, Master Gardener Coordinator. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Sarah Keeley. Hi, I'm Sarah Keeley. I am the Local Foods Coordinator with Buchanan County ISU Extension and Outreach. Perfect. Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Lamos, uh, despite what my computer says. <laughs> and I'm the Local Food Coordinator at ISU Extension and Outreach in Wampolo County. Great. Shannon. I'm Shannon. Um, I'm Program Assistant for Value Added Ag Extension. Great. Arlene. Are you able to introduce yourself, Arlene? Well, we'll, we'll get that. Arlene, I think if it's Arlene Enderton, she is a member of the local foods team and does evaluation. And then Molly, would you like to introduce yourself? Mm-hmm. Here. Do I have video? You should. Um. I just can't see myself, which is weird. Well, if you can just do a quick intro, maybe you can work on sure. that after so we can get going. Yep. Um, my name's Molly Schindler. I work on the communications team for the National Farm to School Network. Excellent. Thank you. And then I've got two phone numbers. Are those someone that's already on the computer or is that someone different? One is mine, Lynn. Jen. Okay, Jen, and then I've got another one that's 641-435-4864. Okay, Donna Matlock, do you want to introduce yourself real quickly and then we'll get started. You're on mute. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Donna Matlock and I am the uh, education consultant with the Department of Ed, the Bureau of Nutrition and Health Services. And I um, cover the whole northeastern part of the western, um, central eastern part of Iowa for the schools and new food and nutrition. Great. Thank you. Okay. Greg and Lee, it's all yours. All right. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm Greg Wallace. I'm the social media coordinator with Iowa State University Extension Outreach. I'm in charge of um, programming our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube channels, as well as just um, helping um, other people throughout our, our extension network to get the most of their social media, essentially. So that's what I kind of hope to offer some tips today and, and some advice to help you guys do the same. Um, and I'm Lee Adcock. I'm the communications specialist for the local foods program within Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Um, and I think Greg and I each kind of split up your questions that some of you sent in. I'm going to try to get to as many of those in that um, and just share some best practices. 
Neither of us has slides today, but we are going to, so we're just gonna visit, and then we are gonna provide some links and resources uh, that will go up on the website, our website, along with the recording of this webinar um, in a day or so. So take notes if you like, but you should be able to get a lot of what we're gonna talk about off of our handouts as well. So I with Greg, um, he's gonna take a few of the topics and then I will, um, a few others will each speak for you know 10 15 minutes or so and um, then we'll take questions and open it up for discussion at any point if you guys want to ask a specific question or get clarification you can either well can they just chime in on video or on audio Lynn or do they need to write questions just speak one way or the other so you're muted but okay <clears throat> I see you nodding there we go you want to get started with your topics? Uh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, good morning. I'm Greg Wallace. I'm the social media coordinator with Iowa State University Extension Outreach in the Advancement Division here at Ames. Um, I'm, as I said, responsible for programming social media networks and also offering support for those throughout the Extension Network. Just, I'm going to just talk on a number of topics this morning. Just um, quick hitters here to kind of give you an idea of ways you can enhance your social media and just. I'm going to start with the front door to your social media, and that's branding. That's one of the most important things we, we hit on here in advancement and with and making sure our social media works look, look nice and look um, inviting. Because it really, it is the front door to your page. It's the first thing that people may see when they find you on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or wherever they find you. Um, and you really do want to have a united front for your page, um, an inviting front for your page to kind of give people an idea of what they're looking at and why it's important, why they should, and look professional most of all. Um, for example, one of the things we have with, uh, with Advancement and Iowa Extension Outreach is Strong Iowa, hashtag Strong Iowa, as we like to call it. Um, and that's consistent branding throughout our pages. Uh, if you look on our Twitter page or Facebook page, um, you will see the cover photo is strong Iowa on there um, in a map of Iowa um, and also if you look at any of our our county pages um, whether it's uh, Al McKee or or uh, Lee or wherever or Fremont wherever down in whatever part of the part of the country uh, part of the state you're in uh, we do have the consistent red branding on our our profiles and we have those available through my extension as well um, we do have numerous resources, including cover photos and profile slash avatar photos. Profile and avatar are the same thing. I think if you're familiar with Facebook more than Twitter, it's, um, it's the profile photos. That it's, a, it's a thing you see there, so um, in, the, in the front page there um, of your, of your, of your uh, social media profile. And we have those for every county in our, in our realm. We have um, a lot of program area uh, um, as well, so um, every any program you could think of, and I think for even for those of you who are not um, directly tied to extension, I think it is important again to just have that consistent branding. You know, make sure that people know what you're about, what your what your um, organization is all about, and have the consistent branding going from cover photo to profile to um, just to, if there's a space to talk a little bit about what you're about, what what your message is about. That's great. That's what you want to do. Um, I think that that's just a real key uh, um the content is key obviously as well but having a good consistent message and consistent branding is important um obviously you want to get your message out there and i think that connecting with the media is crucial um you know make, really make them part of your story um if someone comes out uh, whether it's a tv station radio station newspaper comes out and covers a local foods event for you um, and, and really um, gives you coverage, be sure to link back to them and, and tag them in your photo. Uh, tag, them in, tag them in your comments that you have and the, in your post that you make um, about the post. Um, I think that's really important. I think that number one, it shows that they, you care about them, you care about getting coverage from them. Number two, you are driving traffic back to their website or their, their page or their station as well. And a lot of times I found that's, that's one, one strategy I found that, that really grows our social media and gives, grows our reach um, is tagging the organizations that we, we share the information from. Because a lot of times they'll reshare it themselves. And, you know, for example, we have a Twitter page. We have probably about 
I think a little over over 7,000 followers or so. Um, we're getting close to 8,000, I believe. Um, but um, I will say this, uh, if, you, if, I, if I tag like, say like KWWL, um, that thanks for coming out and covering our event, you know, thanks for coming out covering the Blackhawk County Fair or whatever it is, whatever they do, whether it's a local foods or something like that. If they retweet us, um, then they're, we're reaching, say, whatever, how many more followers they have on their Twitter page. And that's a great way to reach free, reach um, a lot of free advertising, a lot of customers you may not reach otherwise in your area. Like, for example, like we have our speaking foods, we have nutrition, we have Rachel Wall, who's in our human sciences division, who does a uh, two minute segment on KCRG, uh, C Rapids every month. And I always tag her and I tag them when, when we, we share her nutrition segments. And then several times they've retweeted us. We've, you know, we've, if KCRG has like a 75,000 followers, that's 75,000 followers of free advertising that's getting your message out there and coming to, potentially coming to your Twitter page and looking at what you're doing with it. So again, tag them socially. Um, if you have something that's going on, like an event that's coming up, say, hey, don't be afraid. You, you know, don't be shy on social media. Don't be afraid to say, hey, KWAL, check this out, and maybe uh, tag them in the release or something like that. So um, maybe there's a good chance if it's, a, if it's a compelling event or something interesting, they'll come out and cover it. So, And again, once they do that, once they do come out and cover it, thank them you know, profusely. You know, make them part of your story. And obviously, once they're, when they're there as well, just in person, say thank you for coming out and covering it and Ask them what do I need? What what can I what can I help you out with here? Um, really, really make sure they're they're welcome, and there's a good chance they'll come back. Um, another important thing I think that going back to branding and imaging a little bit is just having images on social media. I think if you look down your Facebook or Twitter feed, um, you're going to see that you're going to see a lot of photos, a lot of a lot of a lot of um, even videos now, even uh, GIFs. And I think that um, it's important to have images in your social media. I think that you're, if I'm looking down my screen, if there's an eye-catching photo attached to a story or a link, I'm gonna be much more apt to um, click on that link and find out more about it. And I think the studies have shown that as well, that posts that have images on them are much more engaged with than posts that have plain text. Um, I think it's more likely to get readers' attention, and you want to be compelling. You know, you want to show what the story is about, tell your readers what it's about. I mean, obviously, if you guys have a local foods event that's got a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables in it, I think that's really good. I think that 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 shows um, what the event's about and maybe makes it exciting. Makes it say, man, I'd like to come out and get some of that fruit. You know, I'd like to come out and see what what these guys are doing with local foods and what's 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 happening on the cutting edge of, the, of this, of this event. Um, if it's just someone like sitting in a meeting or staring at this, like I would not, I think a really boring picture would be a picture of me like sitting, I, I, mean, I would not want to say like, uh, take a picture of me like seeing this webinar talking, that'd be kind of boring. That's not a compelling picture. But if you're out and interacting with people, interacting with the community, um, doing things like that, I think that's really important. I think that's a great way to make your social media pop. Um, obviously we, uh, you know, the best option is to use, use your own photos, use your own images that you have. Um, if not, I think that think stock is a good option as well. That's, that's a subscription service that we've used in advancement. Um, Adobe connect as well is when we're, when we've explored as well. Um, don't grab from Google images. <laughs> it's tempting. It's free. But that is in copyright laws, so we don't we do want to avoid that, obviously. So whether you're, um, no matter what you're doing with, if it's, it's it may it may look good to have the image on there, but if, if it's against copyright laws, that's that's not what and not a road you want to go down, obviously. So, since you're talking about copyright laws, um, mm -hmm. is it okay or safe to take those pictures when you're out and about in the community, without um, getting any permission from those of within the picture? Uh, I think it is safe, yes. Um, if you want to be doubly sure, um, we do have, I mean, we do have some permission slips and, and things like that that we that we're, we're download to our site. I could probably, sh I could potentially share those or, or find a, um, a link to those. Um, but I think that unless someone objects in taking a picture, I think it's generally okay. 
Um, I think that that's, that's, it's not a problem. I think if, if they're not an event they, that they've generally consented, I think that you, you walk a fine line with children sometimes, especially in involving 4-H. Uh, I think that they sign a release um, before they join to, to um, understand that they're going to be part of, part of this, this program and they, their pictures may be taken. So, but um, they can, uh, I think otherwise it's okay. I think that, that that's fine. If they, the parents, if those parents opt out, then obviously you don't want to take a picture, but I think that uh, it's okay. So, but I think generally um, it, it's, if you really want to be safe and sorry, then, then I, I, you could offer a lease form, but otherwise I don't think it's any problem. Thank um, you. Sure, no problem. Um, and just going back to a little bit to telling your story, I, as I mentioned, um, social media is free advertising. You know, it's really a great way to get your message out there. You don't have to, there's obviously advertising options on there, but if you just want to use the basic options, you don't have to pay for it. It's, it's, it's a little bit different than using television or radio. And you, you do control your own message as well. So, and that's one thing I would do want to say on that, you know, make sure you represent yourself properly. Um, use proper grammar, use proper spelling, proper punctuation, and use posts that are engaging and but inclusive and not offensive. You know, i I teach social media seminars, um, through extension, and the, the one uh, phrase I like to I like to say is, if your mother would take offense to her, be concerned about it. It's not worth posting. She'd see this and like be like, "Why are you posting this?" <laughs> if your mother would be upset about, it, don't do it. So, um, also, I think that really inclusion is big, and using those using those inclusive words, you know, and, and action words, you know, so say something like, "Join us, come out." Be a part of this, you know. Let them know that you you want them to be part of your part of your event, part of your story. If you are telling an event, or if you want to um, explain something, you want people to be part of. Just action words are good, you know. Especially even in social media, just quick. Check it out. Look at this, you know. Give them a reason to maybe exhort them to kind of look at look a little deeper, look a little further what you're what you're doing. So I think that's really important. And don't be afraid to to be a little bit of a self promoter as well. Um, like if you're like me, I'm on social media a lot of the day because it's my job. <laughs> but I know other people aren't necessarily. That everybody's busy. Everybody has things going on in their lives. You know, maybe they're flipping through Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram, like at the end of a meeting or something like that. If they're they're not like and enthused about it, if they're like, oh, let's get done with this. So what, what's this person saying? That sort of thing. So, <laughs> but people are, the point is that people are on social media different times during the day. They're not always their phones or laptops. You, you may post something at, you know, nine thirty in the morning. They may not be on there. They may, they may go back and through and see it. They may not. Um, I think that, um, it's okay to, to give people multiple options to look at it. Say if you want to you have an important post or important event, you want to do, um, you know, feel free to post a couple of times, post a couple of times during the day, or maybe a couple of times spread out during other different times, maybe at 9 30, 11 30, you know, eight o'clock at night even. I think that's a great way to get people involved and more likely to see your posts. Um, I don't think you need to go overboard. I see sometimes people putting like things out there like 20, 30 times. It's like, geez, that's, that's a little overboard. That's a little much. But if you do a couple times, then I think it's okay. And especially when you, you have to factor in the, the fact that both Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, all three of them have algorithms that maybe it's not necessarily a linear timeline. You go straight back and look um, at what, you, what you're posting and what and you might not see everything in, in, in the perfect order especially on Facebook. Um, even Twitter has now the function uh, you see on your phone or your, or your laptop, they have the what you might have missed feature and maybe pop up some tweets that are a couple hours old for you that you haven't seen or set things you haven't seen. So I think that it's good to, you know, be multiple and, and try to repost stuff if you can, if it's a really important event that you want to get out there. And Twitter actually now does allow you to retweet your own posts as well. So <laughs> I could say post something in, here at 9 a.m. And if I want to go back and put it up at 3 o'clock again, I could hit the retweet button and retweet myself. And it would get back on people's feeds again there. And you can also use the quote tweet function in retweets as well, which allows you to update your message there. Or maybe say, have you seen this? You know, we got this great event going on Saturday. Have you seen this? Um, and, or if there's say like when you get into winter time and there's maybe, maybe have an issue where you have an event you have to cancel, say like, well, 
we're sorry, we inclement weather, this event is canceled, we'll, we'll get it back going um, when we have a chance to, or we reschedule for a couple weeks, so. Um, one last thing I did want to focus on was Instagram as well. I know that's really an emerging topic, emerging social media network um, um, compared to Facebook and Twitter. There's a lot of millennials that are um, using it, even parents are getting into it now as well. Um, Again, the most important thing in Instagram, I think, is just using compelling images, um, using images that pop, using images that are interesting. Um, you know, like I said, the meeting room thing is kind of boring, but if you're out there using action images and people, exciting stuff, I, that's good. I, I like to use a lot of, a lot of um, active images on our Instagram, if you go back and look at it. Um, you know, kids involved in 4-H and things like that and doing activities and things that are exciting and eye-catching. And same thing for just any any image we have. I mean, I think it's it, the better, the more interesting image you have, the more likely it's gonna be shared. Um, obviously, another good way to use Instagram is using hashtags. I like to use as many hashtags as I can on Instagram. You can use them on Twitter as well, although on Twitter you maybe do run into the 140 character limit. On Twitter, Instagram, you don't have that limit. And so, I mean, if I use an image of like, say, kids doing a painting class in 4-H, I may say things like, just as many as I can think of it, connects me to Iowa, connects me to our, our Iowa State base, our extension base, and also just maybe some people that want to see kids painting and they're interested in art. Say like, I'm gonna use like, say something to the extent of, these Forge Clover kids had a great time painting it uh, in Sac County or something like that, essentially. And I'll use like maybe like hashtag Iowa, hashtag Iowa State, hashtag Cyclones, hashtag art, hashtag kids art, <laughs> hashtag 4-H. Uh, I, I don't think, he, there's not a limit to how many relevant hashtags you can use for Instagram. I think then the more people that click on those and see those, that's again free advertising for you joining conversations of, of topics you're being involved, involved yourself in. So I think that uh, that'd be a great way to, that's a great way to really um, enhance your, enhance your reach. I think that's something we've had success with as well. Um, Instagram does have video as well. If you're out in the, in the field and an event and have a, short video clip you want to share that's great i think i've used that sometimes to a good extent um, i will mention just be careful of video if you're if you're doing live video on there be careful of your surroundings and the people there surround you and make sure that you're, you're not going to get any coarse language or anything like that on there you, sometimes you you do uh, have a, a turn uh, tend to tends to um relinquish some control out of that so um just be careful on that extent I think following a lot of people on Instagram is good. Uh, I try to follow as many people at Iowa State and extension connections that I can on Instagram and same thing on Twitter as well. Um, Cause 10 people was, oh, they followed me. That's interesting, I'll follow them back. So um, I think those those are good options for you as well. Um, I think that general Instagram, I think is really an interesting network. And I think it's, it's gonna be something that we'll use more and more as the, as the years go on. Uh, that's really all I've I've got. Anybody have any other questions or? Um, can I, Greg? Um, it, there's a difference between Instagram and then the Twitter. The Twitter is um, there. Is that remain like in a file? And then my understanding is Instagram is something that's not recorded or stays live after a period of time. Or you know, uh, I'm not sure how to word that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no you're um i think you're thinking of snapchat oh okay snapchat right. is something that's a little different it's actually the funny thing is, is <laughs> i feel like sometimes snapchat is is a is a medium that that um you you take a snap and uh, a picture for video or video and you can put it in your story for 24 hours and this and then disappears or you can also send them directly to people as well, directly to friends like as messaging. And then they can look at them once and dis they, once they disappear. I think they re make them replay them as well. But yeah, that's Snapchat. Their Instagram is, is um, does stay out there, does stay in your feed. So you can, if you um, want to get an example out of it, if you look at Instagram, our, our handle is I, uh, at ISU extension, all one word there. So, but Instagram does have also, some features like Snapchat called Instagram Stories, where you can you can um, 
put a, a, a series of pictures or videos in there as well, and they will stay up for just like just like 24 hours, and I think that they, they disappear then as well. So I believe that's – someone correct if I'm wrong in that. I've right. really, really dabbled in that, but um, I think that that's correct. So – and, and Facebook – the funny thing is Facebook is, is – kind of adopting some of the same features they're all kind of chasing the same same tail there sometimes but it's, so it's easy to get confused but yes snapchat is is less definitely less permanent permanent than instagram or twitter or facebook is there one preferred over the other the instagram over tweeting or twitter then or vice versa i think that it depends on, on what you what you want to do with it i think that um Different what audiences we reach. I think Instagram is maybe a little bit younger audience than Twitter. Um, I think Facebook is, is the more established network as well. That Facebook has over over um, a billion active users every month, and Twitter and Twitter has probably about three hundred million. Instagram has about three hundred million. So, but Twitter and Instagram tend to drive a little bit younger audience than Facebook does. Um, depends on what you want to do. You can. I mean, you can even uh, use Instagram. Um, you go into Instagram and look at it, you can even use it for all three networks as well. You can, it's easy to, um, there's little buttons in there. You can toggle and say, I want to post this to Facebook. I want to post this to Twitter and you can post it to all three at once if you want to. So, and I would advise you to maybe experiment, see what works best for you. But uh, I think that um, if you have an image or, or a video, Instagram is a great way to present that. And, but uh, the other two offer functions for that as well. So. Donna, I will just add to what Greg said, um, and he kind of alluded to this, but the question I think before you decide what panel to use is what audience are you looking for? Um, where is your audience mostly getting their social media or their media? Um, I think most of our audience uses Facebook. Um, they probably also use other things, but that is, like he said, by far the giant in the room and everybody uses it and everybody knows how to use it. So mm -hmm. we kind of most of our efforts there. We do have an Instagram account, but I rarely do anything with it because um, that demographic isn't really where my audience lives. So before you kind of embark on any of the things we're going to talk about today, I think it's important to talk with your staff and just think about your particular needs for whatever communication channel you're um, Who do you want to talk to and what do you want them to do? And that will help you plan out a media strategy overall for all of these channels. Well, that's very interesting, and it's helpful when you said that um, the Twitter and Instagram tend to draw the younger generation, which is what we're looking for because our team nutrition has put up a Twitter, and I'm not even I'm not sure that Instagram has been put up yet, but it was. Um, but we know I know that I'm familiar with Facebook reaching out to. Um, I guess our generation a little more. Um, so it's good to know that these two um, lead to re um, reaching lead out to those young ones. I'm going to follow up with Molly because we did speak a little bit about Instagram, but that was one of your questions, Molly, on your <clears throat> email to us before this webinar. Um, is there anything else about Instagram that you were interested in learning about? Well, our Instagram's fairly Instagram developed. Fairly and I, oh, I'm having bad feedback. Um, uh, and we use both functions, the story function and the picture and video. Um, and I feel like I have hashtags down. Um, I think, what question did I send you specifically? How was it worded? It, says, um, it just says best practices for Instagram. So I'm not sure what specific question you might have had but I don't mean to I put guess you maybe spot. taking it to the next level of like beyond 101 of having an Instagram I think we have we just broke maybe 2,000 followers awesome we have mm -hmm. a bigger Instagram but our Facebook and our Twitter have like 60 plus thousand so <laughs> I mean, our Instagram is just followed uh, less. Uh, yeah. Is that a demographic? I mean, is Instagram getting to a group that you really want to focus on, Molly, or do you feel like that might be? Something? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think our demographic, Farm to School, really can cover, and we're the Far National Farm to School Network, so it can cover people that are 
in farm to school, you know, pre-K through 12th grade or working in farm to institution, even farm to college or teachers, practitioners that are actually administrating farm to school programs. So we have a wide range. Okay. Um, so you really kind of need to be every to throw it to Greg just to see if he has any recommendations of maybe further resources for taking your Instagram up another level because um, if we probably don't have a, uh, anything necessarily we could go through step by step right now but I know those resources are out there. Greg do you have a recommendation for something with Instagram that's helpful? Um, I would say use more use more video on it as well. I think that it's good that's more engaging as well. Um, and there's obviously a lot of apps out there. There's uh, apps, ways you can share other people's photos as well. One that I really like is Repost. Um, that's a good way to share other people's photos on Instagram as well, other people's, other people's Instagram posts. And that's good, and maybe that gets more engagement as well. So I think that's a good way to do it. And just, like I said, just follow as many different people as you can uh, on Instagram and, and, and connected to the farm to school method and and get more and I think there, there's a good chance I'll follow you back and get more followers that way as well and get more reach but I think the, like I said using hashtags and that and that sort of thing it sounds like you're on a real good track though thanks I would also add in just because my my sisters are in college many um young people don't actually are using Twitter and Instagram less and are using just snapchat or predominantly using snapchat and maybe that's even younger more like middle school high school but i don't i don't do snapchat <laughs> i was just going to add that into the conversation it's possible molly that they're doing that because they know we're not there you know kind of <laughs> yeah Facebook used to be for college students and then all the grandmas took it over and so kids don't use it anymore so they're always moving on to other technologies so we can chase them there if we think that it has payoff, but otherwise, yeah. you know, I'm guessing they probably aren't getting their news there or their education no. there. They might just be it for their own purposes, which is totally fine. And I'm, you know, they need their yes. spaces. So yeah, that's and a very good point. I've also heard about people having you have private Instagram accounts or secret Instagram accounts, where they they have one public facing for their for their mothers and their and their yes, yes. families to watch, and the other yeah. one with the party. <laughs> so that's that's yeah, definitely turned out there as well. So they're they're trying different ways to there's different ways for them to connect for sure. <laughs> Any other questions for the things that Greg just covered, and then I'll uh, I'll go through some things, and then we'll open it up at the end for all kinds of questions. Cool. Thank you so much, Greg. Mm -hmm. really okay. helpful. I mean, this is such a gigantic topic and you guys all know that. So what we'll do is kind of try to hit some hit things top and then again, provide you with some more resources to chase down if you want to get a little deeper. So I want to make sure that we touch on at least most of the questions that you guys sent in. So I'm going to, um, I guess, just start with one that Ash sent in and I don't even know if she's on today, but she said developing a relationship with the press um, and and Greg talked about this as well. Um, I wanted to point out that there are some resources about that on Extension's website. And I was even wondering, Greg, if you helped write this. There's a really nice seven-page piece called Working with the Media that really gets down into building relationships, how you get to know the media, um, find out what kind of stories they want to do. Do they want fully developed stories or just ideas? Um, really the basis for all of our outreach is developing relationships with our publics and with the media to help us reach our public. So you want to talk to these reporters individually. Um, they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones that are going to decide if your story idea or your expert um, or your event are really worth relaying on. So I guess I would suggest, particularly if you're out in the counties, to introduce yourself to your local reporters. Most of you probably already have done that. And by virtue of working for Extension or whatever organization you're with, they probably already see you as an expert. But particularly if you're new in your role, you're going to want to say, hey, I'm the new farm to education person or farm to school. I'm the new um, early childhood education program person. Just make sure they know who you are. Um, a phone call is great if you can get through you know, walk into the office if it's a paper small enough. For the bigger papers like the dailies, you're probably not going to be able to get that close. But you can try and then follow up with an email and just say, you know, here's what I have to offer you. That's the main thing you want to remember. 
Um, I grew up on a farm in Northwest Iowa, went to school for journalism and communications and have worked over time for TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, public relations offices. Um, and when I was a newspaper editor, I wanted to know where I could go to get background or content on a particular topic. So if you're that person, make sure they know you're there. Um, and then you also, as Greg said, need to be professional. If you are going to produce a news release or a little um, blurb that you want to send them, proofread it, make sure everything's accurate. Um, you have lots of tools at your disposal for media outreach and branding and templates for news releases, for example, on the My Extension website, if you are an extension person. And even if you're not, there are lots of templates out there free in the you know, Googleverse for you to hunt up. Um, I'd be happy to send you some ideas for that if you need them. Um, so I guess remember too that if you are pitching a story to a media person, there needs to be some sort of tension or action or change involved in it. You can't just send them a story and say, hey, here's my idea. Um, I mean, let them know that you're available to do background for stories on that topic. But if you want them to cover an event or some sort of program, um, it needs to have something impactful in it. Um, so there are some suggestions in this seven pager which I'm going to send out to you guys or post on the website for how to write your stories, how to organize a news release, um, basically how to do the basics. So I will post that for you. Um, does anybody have any questions specifically else about media relations? Any challenges, any suggestions? Okay, cool. One of the questions that um, Molly also submitted to us was about story banking, which is a good um, segue, I think. Story banking is basically collecting what I would call impact stories from your audiences, the group you work with, the people you provide services to. How is what you do impacting them? And can you find people that will say, my extension, you know, local foods person is awesome. Here's why. They helped me my farm question, they came out to my farm for a tour, they, um, you know, saved my crop, whatever it is, um, find those people who are willing to talk to you and collect their stories. It can be as simple as having them email you something. You can go out and collect video with them. I mean, we all walk around with a really good camera, right? These are good cameras, especially if it's an iPhone, no plug intended, but all phones now take really good pictures, they take good video, um, it's easy to do. Um, there are some best practices around that, uh, as well, but it's really not hard. You can even do live video from Facebook now. Um, so it's good, to, it's good to always be thinking about, you know, we have our heads down so often delivering our programming. Well, it's great to do that and that's what we exist for, but if other people don't know what we're doing or the impact that it has, then we end up not being as effective as we could be. So those stories are really important and if you want to put together a story bank, um, it can be very simple, very low cost, um, but the whole idea around it is to collect the stories, to package them in a certain way, and then to disperse them somehow, disseminate them somehow. Um, I'll just mention resource, which I think is probably the best one that I've found online, and it's mentioned by a lot of the how-to articles and the best practice articles. It's by familiesusa.org, just one word, Families USA, and they have a story bank toolkit. If you just Google that, you're, you're going to find it. I'm going to put it up on the handouts as well. But it covers all five aspects from creating a plan to building an infrastructure for collecting the stories, collecting the stories, developing them, packaging them, and then how you share those stories with the public. And I think it's a really great resource. It's all free. So I will, um, I will send that out to you guys. So that is story banking. Is there anything else specifically, Molly, that you wanted to ask about story banking? I'm guessing, again, you're probably a little far down the path on it, and I may just have hit the basics, which isn't helpful, but let me know. No, I definitely was looking for a resource of once you gather all of the information, because we're looking at um, having some sort of a form that would feed into maybe an Excel document of some sort but really were our team was interested in how best to organize that okay. and organize it and to make it useful so that it doesn't just end up being a resource that sits there and doesn't get used. Yeah, um, yeah. And 
the I mean, website. I'll think, definitely look at that website you mentioned. Yeah. That's great. I was just going to say, I think you're going to find that really helpful. Um, I did. So good deal. Thank you. Thank right. You. Bet. So some of the other questions. Um, now I've lost them. Where am I? View window. There we go. Uh, let's see. So Jody had sent in several questions. Um, and one of them was about um, top tips for communicating one-on-one -on -one with individuals. Um, what I would call that is developing an elevator speech. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that concept, but I'll just review it real quick. An elevator speech, the name comes from the idea that you're going to meet somebody on an elevator ride and be able to communicate your mission and your projects um, in that 30 to 60 second ride. So that in such a way that the person's going to think, oh, that seems really interesting. I want to know more. Could be members of the public, just building your brand awareness, could be a funder, could be a reporter, but you want to be able to communicate pretty quickly what it is that you do and why they should care. Um, so again, I found a resource I thought was really good. I'll just give some highlights from that and then I'll send it to you. Um, but the idea is that um, you're going to want to treat it kind of like your mission statement, which describes what you do and why. Um, what's your name? What's your relationship to the organization? What's your mission statement and how can you adapt it? Where are you located and where is your impact focused? And why should this person care? Um, so you wanna obviously keep it short. This, <laughs> this little handout I'm looking at says, did you know that the average adult's attention span is about eight seconds? That's shorter than a goldfish's, so you don't have much time to work with. Um, so yeah, 30 to 60 seconds practice, which is a big one. It's easy to get tongue tied, particularly if it's someone who's you know, influential to your mission and you really wanna make a good impression, that's when you tend to choke up. So speak naturally, memorize your main points, but be willing, you know, be ready to kind of relate them in a natural conversational way. Um, beware of your nonverbals, you know, don't slump and cross your arms, don't look angry. Be open, be friendly, pay attention to your body language. Um, and you should use your elevator pitch kind of as a call to action. Um, don't close off the conversation at the end. Say, I would like to stay in touch with you about this. Hand them a flyer, hand them a business card. Um, basically, it's sort of common sense, you know. How would you like to be approached? What has worked with you in the past? Has somebody ever come up to you and introduced a topic or an organization to you and made you think, I'd like to follow up on that? You know, put it through that filter um, of what would make sense to you and what would make an impression on you. Um, so uh, next question that Jody sent was top five tips for communicating via email with groups, for example, a listserv, how to get their attention and how much information to provide in an email. This is a pretty huge topic and there's tons of information out there. There are tons of channels that you can use. Um, so I guess I will just say briefly that um, listservs are one tool um, forums, discussion forums are another, newsletters are another, and she does also mention newsletters. So I would just say, think about who your audience is, and um, if you want them to talk to each other, then a listserv slash forum would be a really good tool for that. Um, everybody uses email. It's probably the most basic tool. You know, you can reach more people on email than you can even on Facebook usually, but you need to have your list, right? You need to have collected those names somewhere. So paying attention to how you do that, um, whether your list is current, it's really time consuming to make sure your list is current. People change emails a lot. People change jobs a lot. So keeping your list fairly, you know, up to date is, is important. But beyond that, then curating your list, um, making sure that you have some guidelines for it that are made public, email that to the people when they join the list, um, can cover everything from what topics they post to how they speak to one another. Um, so just you know, keeping in mind what you want people to do. So if, if you want them to talk amongst one another, that's a listserv function. Um, sharing resources, it can also kind of serve as a bulletin board. But if you want to communicate directly about your brand and your activities to a group of people, a newsletter is probably your best bet. And there are tons of tools out there. If you're an extension person, extension provides coded templates for the three main um, marketing, email marketing software platforms out there, which are MailChimp, iContact, and Constant Contact. Um, you can just 
pop that code right into your account and it will populate this beautiful branded newsletter format with the right colors and you know the justice statement at the bottom. Um, but that said, if you have uh, a different brand, they're easy to use. I use MailChimp because you can have up to 2,000 um, subscribers for free and send out way more than I will ever need in emails every month. Um, but if you go past that level, um, they're all very similar. They're, they're not expensive even past that level. I think, you know, maybe 20 bucks a month gets you a pretty good sized uh, package with mail or with uh, constant contact or eye contact. So use those templates, put in pictures, um, make sure that your stories are short and to the point and have a link for people to go back to the full story on your website. The idea behind those marketing campaigns is to drive people back to your place of business, which is your website, that's your storefront. And once you get them there, um, you wanna be able to capture their information. Obviously, if you're sending them a newsletter, they're already, they've already provided you with an email address. But for example, on our Facebook page for local foods, we have a sign up button as your call to action button on the lower right of your business page in Facebook. You can choose what you want people to do there, donate or sign up or whatever. So we have a sign up button. It takes them to the MailChimp sign up form. Um, it asks very brief information and then they're in your system. So um, make sure you're not losing opportunities to capture the, the people who are interested in what you're doing. Um, we send our newsletter out once a month. It has three little top stories from our blog from the prior month. Picture, little teaser, read more button. Takes them right back to the blog and then they're on our website and hopefully we'll stick around and look a little bit. Um, and our, our list is not huge because we're sending mostly to people around the state of Iowa who are interested in local foods, which is a pretty you know specific audience. And I think we have about 600 and some names right now of which 200 are media. Um, so around 450 that are actually really real people out there who are interested in local foods. Most of you, I think, are on it. If you're not, go to the website and sign up right now. Um, so newsletters, does anybody have any specific questions or experiences to share, recommendations for newsletter or email marketing uh, platforms that you like and why? What are you guys using, if anything? I know you're there. I can hear you breathing. You know, just recently we started the Farm to School newsletter, which is on a weekly basis based on information that Molly shares. And um, I did use MailChimp and it, it is super easy to use. So for someone who's kind of a newbie and a Luddite when it comes to technology, it's, it's been pretty easy to deal with and to use and it's got a lot of great features. So. And I see Kelly just wrote that she's experimenting with MailChimp right now. Um, if you have any specific questions, I've worked in most of the of those programs. They're all quite similar. Just holler or type something into the search or into the chat box. Um, I'm looking at the time and wanting to make sure we don't run, run, run way over. Newspaper options. So many Emma. Um, another one that a lot of people use is Emma or my Emma. You've seen them all. They probably all come into your mailbox regularly. Um, there is a handout on ISU's, uh, my extension uh, website, also about tips for success on newsletters, which I'll share with you guys. Um, it's basically just about how to organize your template, um, how to decide what you're gonna include in your newsletter, how often it's gonna go out, how to write for it, um, what kind of images to use. So it has some good tips about writing style and layout, et cetera. Um, lots of good resources on my extension, which I will be sharing with you non-extension people, hoping some of it will also be useful for you. Um, let's see, what other questions did we have here? Oops. So newsletters, email, one-on-one, -on -one, social media. Yeah, I think those were the main topics that um, were submitted as questions ahead of time. Let me just make sure here. Curriculum guide. So having said that, I will um, let you guys ask specific questions about things that you were hoping to get answered today, if you have them. Because I think I've covered most of what I had in mind. 
Another, another MailChimp um, endorsement there from Kelly Solberg. Thanks, Kelly. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them as well. So if you didn't get to you previously or you had something else come up, I'm happy to help. And if both of you maybe would put your email addresses in the chat to everyone, um, if folks have questions later, and I'll try and include that when we send it out. But um, yeah, if you can put your email address in the chat and then folks, you can write it down. And if you have other questions, you can write and ask Greg or Lee. Yeah. But any, anything else today? Oh, while you've got us, please shout it out. And while you've got each other on the call here. Um, okay, I'm gonna feel a little, little foolish because like Lynn had stated, she being a newbie, I am extremely new to this. Um, I don't understand what the hashtags reference or <laughs> stand for. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting world out there. Greg knows more than I do, so yeah, fun. Yeah, essentially, it's a, it's a way to to join the conversation um, and maybe reach people that are beyond your followers as well. So. Um, one thing I'm, I'm doing when I post, I, I like, I love the Woka Foods blog you guys do, the Woka Foods team does. I think there's some interesting topics there that we share regularly on, on our extension Twitter and Facebook. But for example, when I use on Twitter, um, I always try to use the hashtag Woka Foods. Um, and for example, say, if you go on our site and go through our message and click on the Woka Foods hashtag, you will get not only that message, you'll get all the other people that are, are talking about local foods um, as well, whether whether I'm following them or not. Um, and it's just a kind of way to just really join a larger conversation, be part of something bigger and be part of messages. I think a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to use hashtags. If you watch a sporting event, you watch um, an award show, you may see a hashtag there. And if you use it in your, in your Facebook or your Twitter messaging, um, Again, you can get like live live time conversations like what, what you know what was going on with that why did why did this person win what what's what was that play all about essentially so or even you know local news um, or even even live sporting events or, or entertainment programs as well uh, I think that there's it's just a kind of a way to to get your message out and be part of a larger conversation be careful sometimes hashtags you use um, in some of the situations especially professionally but it's just kind of a way to get your message out there and be part of a, something that's bigger than yourself and maybe and, and again increase your reach so the that, hashtag really represents a group of specific people when you hashtag a topic and it connects to those related to that topic or to draw in other people who are connected to them as well. Is that how I'm interpreting that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Exactly. All right. It's all the people that are, are really talking about that sort of conversation there. So, and Don, I think one of the things that's confusing for me anyway is the idea that is the difference between handles and hashtags. So. A handle is either on Twitter or Facebook, um, the social media identifier for a group or a person, a page or, uh, you know, an actual entity. A hashtag is just a topic identifier. You can make them up. You just throw it out there, whatever appropriate words you think. Hashtag art, like Greg said earlier, if somebody's on Twitter or Facebook and wants to see every post that came up recently about art, they'll type in hashtag art and all those posts will pop up and yours will be among them. Um, there are hashtags that are created by groups like USDA has a variety of hashtags, for example, that you can take advantage of um, about different topics, conservation or beginning farmers that actually sort of quote unquote belong to them. So if you hashtag beginning farmers, USDA, whatever, you can look it up on their website and see what hashtags they're using for a bigger entity like that so that you can join that particular conversation. But Otherwise, they're just kind of generic labels. It's a it's a way for people to search for a topic. Um, so, yeah. It, yeah, go ahead. And there definitely is, like she said, there is other ways to, if you want to have one for your group and own it, that's great as well. As long, I think that those are fine as well as you, as long as you're, you have a little larger group and you have some other people you're using and you're not just the only person using it. For example, we have hashtag strong Iowa that we've used the past couple of years. And I think that's really taken on life its own. If you, if you come to annual conference, um, for example, I've, I've run the, um, 
uh, Twitter board that's been out in the lobby or, or, or even uh, on the screens in, in, in your conference the last couple of years. And I use the hash, you, there's programs you can run using like a hash out, a strong arrow hashtag or whatever hashtag you're going to use. And I can put, uh, um, sort all those messages out and put them up there and put them in the, in the larger context as well. Even if you're having an event or something like that there as well, using things like a tag board. But um, I think that that's definitely one way we've been able to get our message more out there with the hashtag strong Iowa. It's become something that's part of our group um, and something that's big for extension as well. Um, no matter what we're doing, it's kind of an overlying hashtag. So yes, I think overall, I think that, that they're very useful. I, like I said, just be careful. I don't, I don't, you can use, I think they're, you can use more of them on, on, on Instagram than you can on Twitter because you have the 140 character limit on Twitter. But I think they're useful in both contexts. Thank you so much. Yes, no problem. This is Kelly Hansen. Um, going along with that, do you have any suggestions for um, making sure you're using relevant hashtags? Because sometimes I come up with them and I think they're really good and then I try to see if it's trending or not and I'm the only one that's ever said it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I would just... Um, Go and go and look and look at look at what some other people essentially essentially are um, doing your area. You know whether people you follow what hashtags they're using as well. If they're popular, like you said, sometimes if it's it's fun to start a hashtag as well. But if you're the only person using it, it's kind of pointless. You know, there's not really much much reason to do that unless you really get it going. One of the benefits we've had you know, with our strong Iowa hashtag, the fact that we have you know seven eight thousand twitter followers and we have a network of you know 60 counties that are on twitter and a bunch of specialists to use as well so it really kind of builds that momentum but if you don't have that it's kind of, it can be kind of difficult sometimes um i would look and see what other people in your area are doing what, what they're using and what what's what's um relevant in that way before you uh, start one i think that that and getting in, using that and getting involved with it and using ones but using ones that are popular and generating conversation in a positive way. I think those are the best, that's the best um, practice I found for hashtags. Okay, thank you. And is this medium usually used just via phone or is this something you can also do on your computer? Yeah, you can use your computer. Um, just anywhere you can get onto the site of your social media of choice. For example, I use my phone for Facebook, my computer for Facebook. That's a good point, though, Donna, to bring up, which is that I think about half of all social media, maybe it's more now, Greg would know better than I, is now consumed via mobile device. So whatever you're creating, make sure you optimize it for mobile. Um, platforms like MailChimp, for example, or Facebook will show you previews of what you just created in mm -hmm. all the formats, desktop, mobile, et cetera. So you can look and see if it's huge, if it's too long, if the picture's buried. Um, but yeah, you can use them anywhere. Yeah, it's definitely a growing medium for, for mobile versus um, desktop. I use both personally. I have my laptop right here and I have my phone right next to me. So I kind of go back and forth between both. But I know that we've done, we've done, we have done some targeted advertising on Facebook specifically and looking at the, at the, um, analytics and where and where Facebook is sending it, sending our ads, it's definitely predominantly mobile over overlapped over desktop. So, but I think that there's, there's definitely still ways to reach people in both areas. I think both people in both areas are still using social media on, on, the, on both platforms as well. Yep. Thank you. But other questions, you guys, these are great. Keep them coming. I'd say just a few more minutes before we hit an hour or so which seems like as long as we need to do this. What was the question that brought you to the webinar today, if you had one? All right, I'm gonna call that good, Lynn. Do you have any other things you wanted us to talk about? I don't. I would just, as always, let you guys know that um, there will be an evaluation form afterwards. And what that is, is an opportunity just to help all of us, uh, to help me as I invite speakers to, to know what you want from them. Um, you know, if there are things we can do ahead of time. Tried sending out the questions early this time just to give folks a little bit of, of chance to think about it. So again, um, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to get critique uh, and criticism, and, and so, you know, will our speakers. Um, 
I've never had it be in any spirit other than helpful. So I assume that will always be the, the uh, case. So that evaluation will ask you both about this one. And then if you have topics for the future that you want to suggest, we always ask that question. If you would like to be a presenter, this is a peer to peer. And um, Greg and Lee are our peer peers. So they, you know, they are co-workers. This is not a um, this is not supposed to be a lecture series. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you'd like to present on something, that would be great. Please suggest yourself. If you know someone else that you think would be a good presenter, let us know that too. We've typically been having these about every other month. Sometimes like this summer, it's stretched a little bit longer just because summers are summer. And uh, finding a time is difficult with all of our schedules. Um, so I will send that evaluation out. It's, it's pretty easy and quick to fill out. It'll be through Qualtrics. Um, really yeah. appreciate it if you would do that though. It just helps us so much, um, both learn how to do better calls and then get topics for the future. So that should be out either later today or tomorrow. And then if you can just get it in at your earliest convenience, that would be great. Oh, well, I'm excited to share this with, uh, our department. Um, we have our all staff meetings next week. So or the following week, so I'm pretty excited about sharing some of this social media information to help us reach out to the schools and to all the students who participate in the food program and stuff. So thank you so much, it was very helpful. Good, we will have a recording too and Lee will have that on our website where we can uh, share with you in, in an email uh, as soon as that's taken care of too, so. Yes, thank you everyone. Appreciate all right, thank you everyone, have a great day.